Well, hello again. You know, for me, the most fascinating area of biology is developmental biology. I just find it so interesting to learn how a complex multicellular organism develops from a single fertilized egg. In animal development, how do certain cells know that they should become heart cells or liver cells or skin cells? And in plants, how do the cells know if they should be petals or stamens or roots? So I wanted to give you just a brief overview and introduction to the similarities and differences in plant and animal development, and hopefully you'll continue your study of this topic in the future. So let's go over some of the similarities in plant and animal development. In both plants and animals, you get cell division for growth. And here's an example in plant development. We have little baby flowers growing and here's one flower developing. And then here's the carpel in the middle and you can see the carpel is getting longer and longer through cell division. And here's just the stigma just beginning to form. Also in both plant and animal development, you have apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, where cells are programmed to die as part of normal development. The best example of that in plants is the development of xylem. This is the vascular tissue that transports water and minerals through plants. So as the xylem cells are maturing, they die, leaving behind just the cell wall. And when you connect a number of these dead cells together, they form this nice pipe through which water and minerals can flow pretty efficiently. Now, a difference between plant and animal development is that cell migration, the movement of cells, only occurs in animal development. But let's look at another similarity. This is the establishment of polarity. When I say polarity, I mean anytime there's a difference between two sides. So it could be a difference between two sides of a cell or the two sides of an embryo. So in both plants and animals, you have establishment of polarity through unequal cell division, such as what you saw in the plant embryo, and also through unequal distribution of messenger RNA and proteins. So for example, a certain protein might be found, there might be a higher concentration of this protein in one cell versus the other cell. And that protein will tell the cell what it should become. Another fascinating similarity is the role of transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins which activate or repress genes. They turn on or they can turn off certain genes. In development, they have to turn on or turn off tissue-specific genes to tell the cells what they should become, how they should mature. So if you're making petals, a certain transcription factor will activate all the petal-specific genes, and another transcription factor might turn off um, genes that would make a leaf or a root so that that doesn't form. Now, if there's a genetic mutation that disrupts the transcription factor, that can have a severe effect on the development. So I wanted to show you an example from an experiment I did a few years ago. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of normal flowers. And in the middle are just little flower buds. And here's a flower just beginning to open. When I took a transcription factor that is specific for carpels, it uh, is important for the proper development of carpels. And it's normally only on in the carpels. When I turned it on everywhere in the plant, this is what happened. This monstrosity form. The plant was not able to form leaves or flowers. It just formed these weird structures that I don't even know how to describe that all ended in a stigma. So it's as if instead of making any other organ, the plant just kept trying to make these weird carpels. And the plant was sterile. So genetic mutations that disrupt development can have severe effects, such as disrupting the organism's ability to make offspring. And let's look at one more uh, difference between plant and animal development. In animals, most development happens in the embryo and then the fetus. So most of your organs and other body structures, your major body plan is established and developed before you are born. In plants, it's different. Remember, I said that 
plant embryos are pretty simple, just cotyledons, a little hypocotyl, and a little root, nothing else. Most plant development happens after the embryo stage. Most of it happens in the adult, as we might say. Now, why might this be beneficial to the plant? Think about the difference between plants and animals. What's one sort of big difference between them? Well, plants can't move. Plants have to stay in one place and they have to respond to their environment as appropriate. So if there's more light coming from one side, the plant needs to, um, might need to reorient its development and grow towards the light. Or the roots might need to adjust their development to take best advantage of where there's water. Plant needs to be able to respond to proper environmental cues as to when to flower. So in animals, most of the really fascinating stuff happens before birth in the embryo. In plants, most of the fascinating stuff happens after the embryo stage in the adult. So lastly, I just want to summarize what I just talked about. So the similarities were that both plants and animals have cell division for growth. They both have programmed cell death. They have the establishment of polarity. Um, and they have transcription factors that either activate or repress tissue-specific genes so that the cells know what they should become. The difference is that cell migration only happens in animal embryos. And then most of the plant development, most of the interesting stuff in development happens after the embryo stage, unlike in animals. Now the last topic I wanted to touch on is asexual reproduction in plants. So remember, asexual reproduction is the making of offspring that are genetically identical to the parent. There's no meiosis, no production of spores or gametes. There's simply mitosis, just cell division to make a genetic clone of the parents. Plants can do asexual reproduction more easily than many animals. There's different ways that parts of the parent plant can develop into a whole new plant that will be a clone of the parent. I'm not going to go through all the strategies, I just wanted to give you one example, and that is bulbs. So here in this picture, you have garlic. If you bought a garlic head, that's a bulb, each of those individual cloves could make a new plant. So you could take a clove of garlic, plant it in soil, wait for the garlic to grow, a few months later, dig it up, and you'll see that single clove will have multiplied into multiple cloves and become a whole garlic head. Each of those cloves is a clone of the original one. And each of them can produce a new garlic. So here's multiple garlic plants growing out of each clove. They're all genetically identical. This is asexual reproduction. Now think about what are the benefits and disadvantages of asexual reproduction. So one benefit is you are ensured that you reproduce. And remember, your evolutionary fitness is measured by your reproductive success. In this case, in asexual reproduction, there's no need for a mate, no need for pollination. Just make a clone of yourself. You are guaranteed to pass on your genes. But what's the disadvantage? Well, the disadvantage is they are genetically identical. There's no genetic variability. So when is that a problem? Well, it might not be a problem. Asexual reproduction might be the way to go in an environment that's stable. If the environment's not changing and the way you grow and function works well in that environment, then go ahead and clone yourself. You'll have successful offspring that are genetically identical to you. But if the environment is changing, then sexual reproduction and the ability to have genetic variability among the offspring is more um, beneficial. So for example, if there's a drought and there's genetic variability, some of the offspring might survive the drought, others might die. The ones that survived are ensured to, pa to pass on the genes to continue the species. So 
Sexual reproduction better in a fluctuating environment, asexual reproduction better in a stable environment. And just to summarize, with all of your studies of different organisms, keep this in mind, the evolutionary fitness measured by reproductive success. As you learn about different strategies that different organisms have, think about how do these strategies ensure their reproductive success. And lastly, I just since this was a fairly long lesson with multiple parts, I want to summarize what you learned. So first you learn about the flower structure and the different pollination strategies, cross-pollination versus self-fertilization, and how flowers attract pollinators. Then you learn about the angiosperm life cycle, the alternation of generations with the diploid sporophyte and the haploid gametophyte. Then you learn about fertilization and how the pollen tube grows in the cell signaling that goes on for the pollen tube to grow towards the ovule and do that double fertilization. The making of one sperm, fertilizing the egg to make the embryo, second sperm fertilizing the polar nuclei to make the endosperm. Then you learn about embryo development, the role of fruits in protecting and dispersing the seeds, and then how seeds germinate. Then I gave you an overview of some of the similarities and differences in plant versus animal development. And finally, asexual reproduction. So you learned a lot. I hope you found this lesson useful and I'll see you in the next lesson.